a movement that's sweeping across businesses everywhere, here in this country and around the world. And it's all about data. Today, businesses are being inundated with data to the tune of over two and a half million gigabytes that'll be generated in the next 60 seconds alone. What do you do with all that data? To extract insights, you typically turn to a data scientist, but not necessarily anymore, at least not exclusively. Today, the ability to extract value from data is becoming a shared mission, a team effort that spans the organization, extending far more widely than ever before. Today, data science is being democratized. Data science is for all. It's a whole new game. Welcome, everyone. I'm Katie Linendahl. I'm a technology expert, writer, and I love reporting on all things tech. My fascination with tech started very young. I began coding when I was 12, received my networking certs by 18, and a degree in IT new media from Rochester Institute of Technology. So as you can tell, technology has always been a sure passion of mine. Having grown up in the digital age, I love having a career that keeps me at the forefront of science and technology innovations. I spend equal time in the field being hands-on as I do my laptop conducting in-depth research. Whether I'm diving underwater with NASA astronauts, witnessing the new ways which mobile technology can help rebuild the Philippines' economy in the wake of super typhoons, or sharing a first look at the newest iPhones on the Today Show yesterday, I'm always on the hunt for the latest and greatest tech stories. And that's what brought me here. I'll be your host for the next hour, and as we explore the new phenomenon that is taking businesses around the world by storm, and data science continues to become democratized and extends beyond the domain of the data scientist and why there's also a mandate for all of us to become data literate, now that data science for all drives our AI culture. And we're gonna be able to take to the streets and go behind the scenes as we uncover the factors that are fueling this phenomenon and giving rise to a movement that is reshaping how businesses leverage data and putting organizations on the road to AI. So coming up, I'll be doing interviews with data scientists. We'll see real world demos and take a look at how IBM is changing the game with an open data science platform. We'll also be joined by legendary statistician Nate Silver, founder and editor-in-chief of 538, who will shed light on how a data-driven mindset is changing everything from business to our culture. We also have a few people who are joining us in our studio, so thank you guys for joining us. Come on, I can do better than that, right? Live studio audience, the fun stuff. And for all of you during the program, I want to remind you to join that conversation on social media using the hashtag ds for all It's data science for all Share your thoughts on what data science and AI means to you and your business. And let's dive into a whole new game of data science. Now I'd like to welcome my co-host, general manager, IBM Analytics, Rob Thomas. Hello, Katie. Come on, guys. Yeah, seriously. No one's allowed to be quiet during the show, OK? Right or I'll start calling people out. <laughs> so Rob, thank you so much. I think you know this conversation, we're calling it a data explosion happening right now. And it's nothing new. And when you and I chatted about it, it it's, you've been talking about this for years. It, you have to ask, is this old news at this point? Yeah, I mean, well first of all, the data explosion is not coming, it's here. And everybody's in the middle of it right now. What is different is the economics have changed and the scale and complexity of the data that organizations are having to deal with has changed. And to this day, 80% of the data in the world still sits behind corporate firewalls. So that's becoming a problem. It's becoming unmanageable. IT struggles to manage it. The business can't get everything they need. Consumers can't consume it when they want. So we have a challenge here. It's challenging in the world of unmanageable, crazy complexity. If I'm sitting here as an IT manager of my business, I'm probably thinking to myself, this is incredibly frustrating. How in the world am I gonna get control of all this data? And probably not just me thinking it, many individuals here as well. Yeah, indeed. I mean, everybody's thinking about how am I going to put data to work in my organization in a way I haven't done before. Look, you got to have the right expertise, the right tools. The other thing that's happening in the market right now is clients are dealing with multi-cloud environments. So data behind the firewall and private cloud, multiple public clouds, and they have to find a way, how am I gonna pull meaning out of this data? And that brings us to data science and AI. That's how you get there. I understand the data science part, but I think we're all starting to hear more about AI. And it's incredible that this buzzword is happening and how, how do businesses adopt to this AI growth and boom and trend that's happening in this world right now? Well, let me define it this way. Data science is a discipline and machine learning is one technique, and then AI puts both machine learning into practice 
and applies it to the business. So this is really about how getting your business where it needs to go. And to get to an AI future, you have to lay a data foundation today. I love the phrase, there's no AI without IA. That means you're not gonna get to AI unless you have the right information architecture to start with. Can you elaborate though in, in terms of how businesses can really adopt AI and get started? Look, I think there's four things you have to do if you're serious about AI. One is you need a strategy for data acquisition. Two is you need a modern data architecture. Three is you need pervasive automation. And four is you've got to expand job roles in the organization. Data acquisition, first pillar in this you just discussed. Can we start there and explain why it's so critical in this process? Yeah, so let's think about how data acquisition has evolved through the years. 15 years ago, data acquisition was about how do I get data in and out of my ERP system? And that was pretty much solved. Then the mobile revolution happens, and suddenly you've got structured and unstructured data, more than you've ever dealt with. And now you get to where we are today, you're talking terabytes, petabytes of data. Yottabytes, I heard that word the other day. Didn't I heard even that know too. what it meant. Do you know how many zeros that is? I thought we were in Star Wars. Yeah, I like, think it's a lot of zeros. Yottabytes, it's new. So it's becoming more and more complex in terms of how you acquire data. So that's the new data landscape that every client is dealing with. And if you don't have a strategy for how you acquire that and manage it, you're not gonna to get to that AI future. So a natural segue, if you are one of these businesses, how do you build for the data landscape? Yeah, so the question I always hear from customers is we need to evolve our data architecture to be ready for AI. And the way I think about that is it's really about moving from static data repositories to more of a fluid data layer. And we continue with the architecture. New data architecture is an interesting buzzword to hear, but it's also one of the four pillars, so if you can dive in there. Yeah, I mean, it's a new twist on I would, what I would call some core data science concepts. For example, you have to leverage tools with a modern centralized data warehouse, but your data warehouse can't be stagnant to just what's right there. So you need a way to federate data across different environments. You need to be able to bring your analytics to the data because it's most efficient that way. And ultimately, it's about building an optimized data platform that is designed for data science and AI, which means it has to be a lot more flexible than what clients have had in the past. All right, so we've laid out what you need for driving automation, but where does the machine learning kick in? Machine learning is what gives you the ability to automate tasks. And I think about machine learning, it's about predicting and automating. And this will really change the roles of data professionals and IT professionals. Um, for example, a data scientist cannot possibly know every algorithm or every model that they could use, so we can automate the process of algorithm selection. Another example is things like automated data matching or metadata creation. Some of these things may not be exciting, but they're hugely practical, and so when you think about the real use cases that are driving return on investment today, it's things like that. It's automating the mundane tasks. Let's go ahead and come back to something that you mentioned earlier because it's fascinating to be part of talking about this AI journey, but also significant is the new job roles. And what are those other participants in the analytics pipeline? Yeah, I think we're just at the start of this idea of new job roles. I mean, we have data scientists, we have data engineers, now you see machine learning engineers, application developers. What's really happening is that data scientists are no longer allowed to work in their own silo. And so the new job roles is about how does everybody have data first in their mind? And then they're using tools to automate data science, to automate building machine learning into applications. So roles are going to change dramatically in organizations. I think that's confusing, though, because we have several organizations that are saying, is that highly specialized roles just for data science, or is it applicable to everybody across the board? Yeah, and that's the big question, right? Is everybody's thinking, how will this apply? Do I want this to be just a small set of people in the organization that will do this, but our view is data science has to be for everybody. It's about bring data science to everybody as a shared mission across the organization. Everybody in the company has to be data, liter data literate and participate in this journey. So overall, group effort has to be a common goal and we all need to be data literate across the board. Absolutely. Done deal. But at the end of the day, it's kind of not an easy task. <laughs> it's not, it's not easy, but it's maybe not as big of a shift as you would think, because look, you have to put data in the hands of people that can do something with it. So it's very basic, give access to data. Data is often locked up in a lot of organizations today. Give people the right tools, embrace the idea of choice or diversity in terms of those tools, that gets you started on this path. 
It's interesting to hear you say essentially you need to train everyone though across the board when it comes to the data literacy. And I think people that are coming into the workforce don't necessarily have a background or a degree in data science. So how do you manage? Yeah, so in many cases that's true. I will tell you some universities are doing amazing work here. I, I, one example, University of California, Berkeley, they offer a course for all majors so no matter what you're majoring in, you have a course of foundations of data science, how do you, you know, bring data science to every role. So it's starting to happen. We at IBM provide data science courses through cognitiveclass.ai. It's for everybody, it's free. And look, if you wanna get your hands on code and just dive right in, you go to datascience.ibm.com. The key point is this though, it's more about attitude than it is aptitude. I think anybody can figure this out, but it's about the attitude to say we're putting data first and we're gonna figure out how to make this real in our organization. I also have to give a shout out to my alma mater because I have heard that there is an offering in an MS in data analytics and they are always on the forefront of new, new technologies and new majors and on trend and I've heard that the placement behind those jobs, people graduating with that MS is high. I'm sure it's very high. So go Tigers. Yep. <laughs> All right, Tangential, let me get back to something else you touched on earlier because you mentioned that a number of customers ask you, how in the world do I get started with AI? It's an overwhelming question. Where do you even begin? What do you tell them? Yeah, well, things are moving really fast. Um, but the good thing is most organizations I see, they're already on the path, even if they don't know it. They might have a BI practice in place. They've got data warehouses. They've got data lakes. Let me give you an example. AMC Networks, they produce a lot of the shows that I'm sure you watch, Katie. Yes, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, any fans? Yeah, we got a few. <laughs> Well, you taught me something I didn't even know because it's amazing how we have all these different industries, but yet media in itself is impacted too. And this is a good example. Absolutely. So AMC Networks, think about it. They've got ads to place. They want to track viewer behavior. What do people like? What do they list, dislike? So they have to optimize every aspect of their business from marketing campaigns to promotions to scheduling to ads. And their goal was transform data into business insights and really take the burden off of their IT team that was heavily burdened by obviously a huge increase in data. So their VP of BI took the approach of using machine learning to process large volumes of data. They used a platform that was designed for AI and data processing. It's the IBM analytics system where it's a data warehouse, data science tools are built in, it has in-memory data processing, and just like that, they were ready for AI, and they're already seeing that impact in their business. Do you think a movement of that nature kind of presses the other organ media conglomerates and organizations to say, we need to be doing this too? I think it's inevitable that everybody, you're either gonna be playing, you're either gonna be leading, or you're gonna be playing catch up. And so, as we talk to clients, we think about, how do you start down this path now, even if you have to iterate over time, because otherwise you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be behind. One thing worth noting is, you know, we talked about analytics to the data. It's analytics first to the data, not the other way around. Right. So, look, we as a practice, we say you want to bring data to where the data sits because it's a lot more efficient that way. It gets you better outcomes in terms of how you train models and it's more efficient. And we think that leads to better outcomes. Other organizations will say, hey, move the data around it. Everything becomes a big data movement exercise. But once an organization has started down this path, they're starting to get predictions, they want to do it where it's really easy, and that means analytics applied right where the data sits. And worth talking about the role of the data scientists in all of this, it's been called the hot job of the decade, and Harvard Business Review even dubbed it the sexiest job of the 21st century. Yes. I want to see this on the cover of Vogue. Like, I want to see the first data scientist female preferred on the cover of Vogue. Like that would be amazing. Perhaps, perhaps you can. People agree. So <laughs> what changes for them? You know, it's, it's, it's a challenging in terms of, we talk data science for all. Where do all the data, is it data science for everyone and how does it change everything? Well, I think of it this way. AI gives software superpowers. It really does. It changes the nature of software. And at the center of that is data scientists. So a data scientist has a set of powers that they've never had before in any organization. And that's why it's a hot profession. Now, on one hand, this has been around for a while. We've had actuaries, we've had statisticians that have really transformed industries. But there are a few things that are new now. We have new tools, new languages, broader recognition of this need. And while it's important to recognize this critical skill set, you can't just limit it to a few people. This is about scaling it across the organization 
and truly making it accessible to all. So then do we need more data scientists? Or is this something you train, like you said, across the board? Well, I think you want to do a little bit of both. We, we want more, but we can also train more and make the ones we have more productive. The way I think about it is there's kind of two markets here, and we call it clickers and coders. I like that. That's good. So let's talk about what that means. So clickers are basically somebody that wants to use tools, create models visually. It's drag and drop, something that's very intuitive. Those are the clickers. Nothing wrong with that. It's been valuable for years. There's a new crop of data scientists. They want to code. They want to build with the latest open source tools. They want to write in Python or R. These are the coders. And both approaches are viable. Both approaches are critical. Organizations have to have a way to meet the needs of both of those types. And there's not a lot of things available today that do that. Well, let's keep going on that. Because I hear you talking about the data scientist role and how it's critical to success. But with the new tools, data science and analytics skills can extend beyond the domain of just the data scientist. That's right. So look, we're unifying coders and clickers into a single platform, which we call IBM Data Science Experience. And as the demand for data science expertise grows, so does the need for these kind of tools to bring them into the same environment. And my view is if you have the right platform, it enables the organization to collaborate, and suddenly you've changed the nature of data science from an individual sport to a team sport. So as somebody that, my background is in IT, the question is really, is this an additional piece of what IT needs to do in 2017 and beyond, or is it just another line item to the budget? So I'm afraid that some people might view it that way, as just another line item. But I would challenge that and say, data science is going to reinvent IT. It's going to change the nature of IT. Mm -hmm. And every organization needs to think about, what are the skills that are critical? How do we engage a broader team to do this? Because once they get there, this is the chance to reinvent how they're performing IT. Challenging or not? Uh, look, it's all a big challenge. Think about everything IT organizations have been through. Some of them were late to things like mobile, but then they caught up. Some were late to cloud, but then they caught up. I would just urge people, don't be late to data science. Use this as your chance to reinvent IT. Start with this notion of clickers and coders. This is a seminal moment, much like mobile and cloud was, so don't be late. And I think it's critical because it could be so costly to wait. And Rob and I were even chatting earlier how data analytics is just moving into all different kinds of industries. And I can tell you, even personally, being affected by how important the analysis is in working in pediatric cancer for the last seven years, we, I personally implement virtual reality headsets to pediatric cancer hospitals across the country. And it's great, and it's working phenomenally, and the kids are amazed, and the, the staff is amazed, but the phase two of this project is putting in little metrics in the hardware that gather the breathing, the heart rate, to show that we have data, proof, that we can hand over to the hospitals to continue making this program a success. So just an, it's a great example. an interesting it's example. Saving lives, yes. it's also applying a lot of what we talked about. Exciting stuff in the world of data science. Yes, look, I'd just add, this is an existential moment for every organization, because what you do in this area is probably gonna define how competitive you are going forward. And think about if you don't do something. What if one of your competitors goes and creates an application that's more engaging with clients? So my recommendation is start small, experiment, learn, iterate on projects, define the business outcomes, then scale up. It's very doable, but you gotta take the first step. First step, always critical. And now we're gonna get to the fun hands-on part of our story, because in just a moment, we're gonna take a closer look at what data science can deliver and where organizations are trying to get to. All right, thank you, Rob. And now we've been joined by Siva Ann, who is going to help us navigate this demo. First, welcome Siva. Give him a big round of applause. Yeah. All right, Rob, break down what we're going to be looking at. You take over this demo. All right, so this is going to be pretty interesting. So Siva is going to take us through. So he's going to play the role of a financial advisor who wants to help better serve clients through recommendations. And I'm going to really illustrate three things. One is, how do you federate data from multiple data sources, inside the firewall, outside the firewall? How do you apply machine learning to predict and to automate? And then how do you move analytics 
closer to your data. So what you're seeing here is a custom application for an investment firm. So Siva, our financial advisor, welcome. So you can see at the top, we've got market data. We've pulled that from an external source. And then we got Siva's calendar in the middle. He's got clients on the right side. So page down, what else do you see down there, Siva? I can see the recent market news. And in here, I can see that JP Morgan is calling for a US dollar rebound in the second half of the year. And I have upcoming meeting with Leo Rakes. I can get. So let's go in there. So why don't you click on Leo Rakes? So this is so, so you're you're sitting at your desk. You're deciding how you're going to spend the day. You know you have a meeting with Leo. So you click on it. You mid, you immediately see. All right. So what do we know about him? We've got data governance implemented. So we know we know his age. We know his degree. We can see he's not that aggressive of a trader. Only six trades in the last few years. But then where it gets interesting is you go to the bottom, you start to see predicted industry affinity. Where did that come from? How do we have that? So these green lines and red arrows here indicate the trending affinity of Leo Rakes for particular industry stocks. What we have done here is we have built machine learning models using customer's demographic data, his stock portfolios, and browsing behavior to build a model which can predict his affinity for a particular industry. Interesting. So I like to think of this, we call it celebrity experiences. So how do you treat every customer like they're a celebrity? So to some extent, we're reading his mind because without asking him, we know that he's going to have an affinity for auto stocks. So we go down, now we look at his portfolio. You can see, okay, he's got some different holdings. He's got Amazon, Google, Apple, and then he's got Race, which is the ticker for Ferrari. You can see that's done incredibly well. And so, as a financial advisor, you look at this and you say, all right, we know he loves auto stocks. Ferrari's done very well. Let's create a hedge. Like, what kind of security would interest him as a hedge against his position for Ferrari? Can we go figure that out? Yes. Given I know that he's got an affinity for auto stocks, and I also see that Ferrari has got some tremendous gains, I want to lock in these gains by hedging. And I want to do that by picking a auto stock which has got negative correlation with Ferrari. So this is where we get to the idea of in database analytics, because you start clicking that and immediately we're getting instant answers of what's happening. So what do we find here? We're going to compare Ferrari and Honda? I'm going to compare Ferrari with Honda. And what I see here instantly is that Honda has got a negative correlation with Ferrari, which makes it a perfect mix for his stock portfolio, given he has affinity for auto stocks and it correlates negatively with Ferrari. These are very powerful tools at the hand of a financial advisor. You think about it, as a financial advisor, you wouldn't think about federating data, machine learning, pretty powerful. Yes, so what we have seen here is that using the common SQL engine, we've been able to federate queries across multiple data sources, DB2 warehouse on the cloud, IBM's integrated analytics system, and Hortonworks powered Hadoop platform for the news feeds. We have been able to use machine learning to derive innovative insights about his stock affinities and drive the machine learning into the appliance closer to where the data resides to deliver high performance analytics at scale. We are yes. able to run millions of these correlations across stocks, currency, other factors, and even score hundreds of customers for their affinities on a daily basis. That's great. Siva, thank you for playing the role of financial advisor. So I just want to recap briefly, because it's really powerful technology that's really simple. So we federated, we aggregated multiple data sources from all over the web and internal systems and public cloud systems. Machine learning models were built that predicted Leo's affinity for a certain industry, in this case automotive. And then you see when you deploy analytics next to your data, even a financial advisor, just with a click of a button, is getting instant answers so they can go make, be more productive in their next meeting. This whole idea of celebrity experiences for your customer, that's available for everybody if you take advantage of these types of capabilities. Katie, I'll hand it back to you. Good stuff, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Siva. Powerful demonstration on what we've been talking about all afternoon. And thank you again to Siva for helping us navigate. Should we give him one more round of applause? We're going to be back in just a moment to look at how we operationalize all of this data. But in first, here's a message from me.
If you're a part of a line of business, your main fear is disruption. You know data is the new gold and can create huge amounts of value. So does your competition, and they may be beating you to it. You're convinced there are new business models and revenue sources hidden in all the data. You just need to figure out how to leverage it. But with the scarcity of data scientists, you really can't rely solely on them. You need to be more people throughout the organization that have the ability to extract value from data. And as a data science leader or data scientist, you have a lot of the same concerns. You spend way too much time looking for, prepping, and interpreting data and waiting for models to train. You know you need to operationalize the work you do to provide business value faster. What you want is an easier way to do data prep and rapidly build models that can be easily deployed, monitored, and automatically updated. So whether you're a data scientist, data science leader, or in a line of business, what's the solution? What will it take to transform the way you work? That's what we're going to explore next. All right, now it's time to delve deeper into the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty of operationalizing data science and creating a data-driven culture. How do you actually do that? Well, that's what these experts are here to share with us. I'm joined by Nir Caldero, who's head of data science at Galvanize, which is an education and training organization. Trisha Wong, who is co-founder of Sudden Compass, a consultancy that helps companies understand people with data. And last but certainly not least, Michael Lee, founder and CEO of Data Incubator, which is a data science training company. All right, guys, shall we get right to it? Yeah. All right. So, data explosion happening right now, and we are seeing it across the board. I mean, I just shared an example of how it's impacting my philanthropic work in pediatric cancer, but you guys each have so many unique roles in your business life. How are you seeing it just blow up in your fields? Yeah, you? for example, like at Governize, we train mainly Fortune 500 companies, and just by looking at the demand of companies that wants us to help them go through this digital transformation, it's mind-blowing data point by itself. Okay. Well, we're seeing what's, what's going on is that data science, like as the theme is, is that it's actually for everyone now. But what's happening is that it's actually meeting non-technical people. But what we're seeing is that when non-technical people are implementing these tools or coming at these tools without a baseline of da uh, data literacy, they're oftentimes using it in ways that distance themselves from the customer because they're implementing data science tools without a clear purpose, without a clear problem. And so what we do at Sudden Compass is that we work with companies to help them embrace and understand the complexity of their customers because oftentimes they're misusing you know, data science to try and flatten their understanding of the customer as if you can just do more traditional marketing where you're putting people into boxes. And I think the whole ROI of data is that you can now understand people's relationships at a much more complex level at a greater scale before. But we have to do this with basic data literacy, and this has to involve technical and non-technical people. Well, you can have all the data in the world, and I think it speaks to, if you're not doing the proper, the proper movement with it, forget it. It means right. nothing right. at the same yeah, time. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that when you look at the huge explosion in data, that comes with it a huge explosion in data experts, right? We call them data scientists, data analysts. And sometimes there are people who are very, very talented, like the people uh, here. But sometimes you have people who are maybe rebranding themselves, right? Trying to uh, move up their title one notch to, to try to attract that higher salary. And I think that that's one of the things that customers are coming to us for, right? They're saying, hey, look, there are a lot of people that call themselves data scientists, but we can't really help, we can't really distinguish. So we sort of run a fellowship and we help companies hire from a really talented group of folks who are sort of truly data scientists and who know all those kind of really important data science tools. And we also help companies internally, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies who are looking to grow that data uh, science practice that they have. And we help clients like McKinsey, BCG, Bain, uh, train up their customer, uh, sorry, their clients, uh, sorry, their workers to uh, be, be more data talented and to build up that data science uh, capabilities. And you know, this is something you work with a lot, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And when we were speaking earlier, you were saying many of these companies can be in a panic. Yeah. Explain that. Yeah, so you know, not all Fortune 500 companies are fully data driven. And we know that the winners in this fourth industrial revolution, which I like to call the machine intelligence revolution, will be companies who navigate and transform the organization to unlock the power of data science and machine learning. And the companies that are not like that or not utilize data science and predictive power well will pretty much get shredded. So they are in panic. Trisha, companies have to deal with data behind the firewall and in the new multi-cloud world. How do organizations start to become driven right to the core? I think the most urgent 
question to become data-driven that companies should be asking is how do I bring the complex reality that our customers are experiencing on the ground into the corporate office, into the data models? So the, the, that question is critical because that's how you actually prevent any big data disasters and that's how you leverage big data. Because when your data models are really far from your human models, that's when you're gonna do things that are really far off from how, you know, it's gonna not feel right. You know, that's when Tesco had their, you know, terrible, you know, big data disaster that they're still recovering from. And so that's why I think it's really important to understand that you, when you implement big data, you have to further embrace thick data, the qualitative, the emotional stuff that is difficult to quantify. But then comes the difficult art and science that I think is the next level of data science, which is that getting non-technical and technical people together to ask, how do we find those unknown nuggets of insights that are difficult to quantify? Then how do we do the next step of figuring out how do you mathematically scale those insights into a data model so that it actually is reflective of human understanding? And then we can start making decisions at scale. But you have to have that first. That's absolutely right, and I think that, you know, when we think about what it means to be a data scientist, right, I always talk, think about it in these sort of three pillars. You have the math side, right, you have to have that kind of stats, uh, hardcore machine learning and a background, right, you have the programming side. You, you don't work with small amounts of data, you work with large amounts of data, you gotta be able to type the code to make uh, those computers run. But then the last part is that human element, right, you have to understand the domain expertise, you have to understand what it is that I'm an actually analyzing, what's the business proposition, and how are the clients, how are the users actually interacting with the system, right? That human element that you're talking about. And I think having somebody who understands all of those, and not just in isolation, but is able to marry that understanding across those different topics, that's what makes a data scientist. But I find that we don't have people with those skill sets. And right now, the way I see teams being set up inside companies is that they're creating these isolated, you know, data unicorns, that these data scientists that have graduated from your programs, which are great, but they don't involve the people who are the domain experts. They don't involve the designers, the consumer insight people, the people, the sales people, the people who spend time with the customers day in, day out. Somehow they're left out of the room. They're consulted, yeah. but they're not a stakeholder. And I, I, yeah. Can I actually yeah, give please. a quick example? So for example, I, we, we had governors trained the executives and the managers, and then the technical people, the data scientists and the analysts, but in order to actually see all the ROI behind the data, you also have to have a, create a fluid conversation between non-technical and technical people. And this is a major trend now. A major, there is a major gap. Uh, we need to increase awareness and kind of like create a new kind of like environment where technical people also talk seamlessly with non-technical yeah. ones. And that's one of the things that we see a yeah. lot, right? It's one of the trends in the major trend. data science mm -hmm. training is it's not just for the data science technical experts, right? It's not just for one type of person. So a lot of the training we do is sort of data, uh, data engineers, people who are more on the software engineering side, learning more about the stats and math. And then people yeah. who are sort of traditionally on the stats side, learning more about the engineering. And then managers and people who are data analysts learning about both. Michael, I think you said something that was of interest too, because I think we can look at IBM Watson as example in working in healthcare, the human component. Because oftentimes we talk about machine learning and AI and, and data, and you get worried that the, you still need that human component, especially in a world of healthcare. And I think that's a very strong point when it comes to the data analysis side. Is there any particular yeah. example you can speak I mean, to that? So, I mean, I think that like there was this real, uh, really excellent paper a while ago talking about a lot of the neural nets that have been trained on uh, sort of uh, te textual data, so looking at sort of different corpuses, and they found that these models were highly, highly sexist, right? They would read these corpuses, and it's not because neural nets themselves are sexist, it's because they're reading the things that we write, and it turns out that we write kind of sexist things. Um, and they would sort of find all these patterns in there that were sort of latent, uh, that had a lot of sort of uh, things that maybe we would cringe at if we sort of saw, and I think that's, one of the really important aspects of the human element, right? It's being able to come in and sort of say like, okay, I know what the biases of the systems are, I know what the biases of the tools are, I need to figure out how to use that to make the tools, uh, make the world a better place. And like another area where this comes up all the time is uh, lending, right? So the federal government has said, and we have a lot of clients in the financial services space, uh, the federal government, uh, so they, they're constantly under these kind of rules uh, that they can't uh, make discriminatory lending practices based on a whole set of protected categories, race, sex, uh, gender, things like that. But it's very easy when you train a model uh, on credit scores to pick that up, right? And then to uh, have a model that's inadvertently sexist or racist. 
And that's where you need the human element to come back in and say like, okay, look, you're using, the classic example would be zip code, right? You're using zip code as a variable. But when you look at it, zip code is actually highly correlated with race, and you can't do that. So you may inadvertently, by sort of following the math and being a little naive about the problem, inadvertently introduce something really horrible into a model, uh, and that's where you need a human element to sort of step in and say, okay, hold on, slow, slow, the, you know, slow things down. This isn't the right way to go. And the Trish, I feel like I, I can feel her ready <laughs> yes, to respond. I'm ready. She's like, let me have at it. And the people, here it is. And the people who are really <laughs> great at providing that human intelligence are social scientists. We are trained to look for bias and to understand bias in data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. And I th really think that we're gonna have less of these kind of problems if we had more integrated teams. If it was a mandate from leadership to say, no data science team should be without a social scientist or ethnographer or qualitative researcher of some kind to be able to help see these biases. But the, the, the talent piece is actually the most crucial yeah. one here. If you look about how to enable machine intelligence in organization, there are the pillars that I have in my head, which is the culture, the talent, and the technology infrastructure. And I believe and I saw in you know, working very closely with the Fortune 100 and 200 companies that the talent piece is actually the most important, crucial, hard to get. I totally that's agree. Absolutely true. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's sort of like how we came up with our business model. Companies were basically saying, hey, I can't hire data scientists. And so we have a fellowship where we get 2,000 applicants each quarter, we take the top 2%, and then we, we sort of train them up, uh, and we work with hiring companies who then want to hire from that population, right? So we're sort of helping them solve that problem. And the other half of it is really around training. Because with a lot of this, a lot of industries, especially if you're sort of in a more regulated industry, there's a lot of nuances to what you're doing. And the fastest way to develop that data science or AI talent may not necessarily be to hire folks uh, who are coming out of a PhD program. It may be uh, to take folks internally who have a lot of that domain knowledge that you have and get them trained up on those data science techniques. So we've had you know, large insurance companies come to us and say, hey, look, you know, we hire three or four folks from you a quarter. That doesn't move the needle for us. What we really need is take the 1,000 actuaries and statisticians that we have and get all of them trained up to become a data scientist and become data literate in this new open source world. And Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, ladies first. Go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? No, uh, no please, fight <laughs> first. I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Nir. Um, so, you know, uh, this is actually a trend that we have been seeing in the past year or so that companies kind of like start to look um, how to uh, upskill and look for talent within the organization so they can actually move them to become more data literates and you know navigate them from analyst to data scientist and from data scientist to machine learner. So this is actually a trend that is uh, happening already for, for a year or so. Yeah, but I also find that after they've gone through that training and getting people skilled up in data science, the next problem that I get is executives coming to say, we've invested in all of this. We're still not moving the needle. We've already invested in the right tools. We've gotten the right skills. We have enough scale of people who have these skills. Why are we not moving the needle? And what I explain to them is, look, you're still making decisions in the same way, and you're still not involving enough of the non-technical non people, especially from marketing, which is now, CMOs are much more responsible for driving growth in their companies now. But oftentimes, it's so hard to change the old way of marketing, which is still like very segmentation, you know, demographic, variable based and we're trying to move people to say, no, you have to understand the complexity of customers and not put them in boxes. And I think underlying a lot of this discussion is this question of culture, right? How do you build a data-driven culture? Absolutely. And I think that that uh, culture question, one of the ways it sort of comes up quite often in, uh, especially in large Fortune 500 enterprises, uh, is that they are very, they're not very comfortable with, so for example, open source architecture, right? Open source tools. And there's sort of some sort of residual bias that that's somehow dangerous or uh, is a security vulnerability. And I think that that's part of the cultural challenge that they often have in terms of how do I build a more data-driven organization? Well, a lot of the talent really wants to use these kind of tools. And I mean, just to give you an example, we uh, are partnering with one of the major cloud providers um, to sort of help make open source tools more user friendly on their platform, right? So trying to help them uh, attract the best, uh, the, the best technologists to use their platforms because they want and they understand the value of having that kind of uh, open source technology work seamlessly uh, on their platforms. So I think that just sort of goes to show you how important op uh, open source is in this uh, movement and how much large companies and Fortune 500 companies and a lot of the ones we work with have to embrace that.
Yeah, and I'm seeing it in our work, even you know, when we're working with Fortune 500 companies, is that they've already gone through the first phase of data science work where I explained it, really, it was all about the tools and getting the right tools and architecture in place. And then companies started moving into getting the right skill set in place, right. getting the right talent. And what you're talking about with culture is really where I think we're talking about the third phase of data science, which is looking at communication of these technical frameworks so that we can get non-technical people really comfortable in the same room with data scientists. That is going to be the phase. That's really where I see the pain point. And that's why at Sudden Compass we're really dedicated to working with, I think, you know, each other to figure out how do we solve this problem now. And I think that communication between the technical stakeholders and management and leadership, that's a very critical piece of this, right? Like, you can't have a successful data science organization without that. Absolutely. And I think that actually some of the most popular trainings we've had recently are from uh, managers and executives who are looking to say, like, how do I become more data savvy, right? How do I figure out what is this data science thing and how do I communicate with my data scientists? You guys made this way too easy. I was just going to get some popcorn and watch it play out. Vera, last 30 seconds. I want to leave you with the opportunity to anything you want to add to this conversation. I think, um, you know, one thing to conclude this is to say that companies that are not data driven, it's about time to hit refresh and figure out how they transition and, you know, their organization to become data driven, to become agile and nimble so they can actually see all the opportunities from this fourth industrial revolution. Otherwise, unfortunately, um, they will have a hard time to survive. All agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. <laughs> Michael, uh, okay. Trish, Nir, thank you so much. Thank Fascinating you. discussion. And thank you guys again for joining us. We will be right back with another great demo right after this. Thank you, Katie. Once again, thank you for an excellent discussion. Weren't they great, guys? And thank you for everybody who is tuning in on the live webcast. As you can hear, we have an amazing studio audience here. And we're going to keep things moving. I'm now joined by Daniel Hernandez and Siva Ann. And we're going to turn our attention to how you can deliver on what they're talking about using data science experience to do data science faster. Thank you, Katie. Steve and I are going to spend the next 10 minutes showing you how you could deliver on what they were saying using the IBM data science experience to do data science faster. We'll demonstrate through new features we introduced this week, how teams can work together more effectively across the entire analytics lifecycle, how you could take advantage of any and all data, no matter where it is and what it is, how you could use your favorite tools from open source, and finally, how you could build models anywhere and deploy them close to where your data is. Remember the financial advisor app Rob showed you? To build an app like that, we needed a team of data scientists, developers, data engineers, and IT staff to collaborate. We do this in the data science experience through a concept we call projects. When I create a new project, I can now use the new GitHub integration feature. We're doing for data science what we have been doing for developers for years. Distributed teams can work together on analytics projects, and take advantage of GitHub's version management and change management features. This is a huge deal. Let's explore the project we created for the Financial Advisor app. As you can see, our data engineer, Joanne, our developer, Rob, and others are collaborating on this project. Joanne got things started by bringing together the trusted data sources we need to build that. Taking a closer look at the data, we see that our customer and profile data is stored in our recently announced IBM integrated analytics system, which runs safely behind our firewall. We also needed macroeconomic data, which she was able to find in the Federal Reserve, and she stored it in our DB2 warehouse on cloud. And finally, she selected stock news data from nasdaq.com and landed that in a Hadoop cluster, which happens to be powered by Hortonworks. We added a new feature to the data science experience so that when it's installed with Hortonworks, it automatically uses the native security and governance controls within the cluster so that your data is always secure and safe. Now we want to show you the news data we stored in the Hortonworks cluster. This is the main administrative console. It's powered by an open source project called Ambari. And here's the news data. It's in Parquet files stored in HDFS, which happens to be a distributed file system. To get the data from NASDAQ into our cluster, 
We used, we used IBM's big integrate and big quality to create automatic data pipelines that cleanse, acquire, that acquire, cleanse, and ingest that news data. Once the data is available, we use IBM's big SQL to query that data using SQL statements that are much like the ones we would use for any relational data, including the data that we have in the integrated analytics system and EB2 warehouse on cloud. This and the federation capabilities that Big SQL offers dramatically simplifies data acquisition. Now we want to show you how we support a brand new tool that we're excited about. Since we launched last summer, the data science experience has supported Jupyter and R for data analysis and visualization. In this week's update, we deeply integrated another great open source project called Apache Zeppelin. It's known for having great visualization support, advanced collaboration features, and is growing in popularity amongst the data science community. This is an example of Apache Zeppelin and the notebook we created through it to explore some of our data. Notice how wonderful and easy the data visualizations are. Now we want to walk you through the Jupyter notebook we created to explore our customer preference for stocks. We use notebooks to understand and explore data, to identify the features that have some predictive power. Ultimately, we're trying to assess what ultimately is driving customer stock preference. Here we did the analysis to identify the attributes of customers that are likely to purchase auto stocks. We use this understanding to build our machine learning model. For building machine learning models, we've always had tools integrated into the data science experience. But sometimes you need to use tools you're already invested in, like our very own SPSS, as well as SAS. Through a new import feature, you can easily import those models created with those tools. This helps you avoid vendor lock-in, and simplify the development, training, deployment, and management of all your models. To build the models we used in the app, we could have coded, but we prefer a visual experience. We used our customer profile data in the integrated analytics system, used the auto data preparation feature to cleanse our data, choose the binary classification algorithms, let the data science experience evaluate between logistic regression and gradient boosted tree, it's doing the heavy work for us. As you can see here, the data science experience generated performance metrics that show us that the gradient boosted tree is the best performing algorithm for the data we gave it. Once we save this model, it's automatically deployed and available for developers to use. Any application developer can take this endpoint and consume it like they would any other API inside of the apps they built. We've made training and creating machine learning models Super simple, but what about the operations? A lot of companies are struggling to assure their model performance remains high over time. In our financial advisor app, we know that customer data changes constantly, so we need, to, we need to always monitor model performance and ensure that our models are retrained as is necessary. This is a dashboard that shows the performance of our models and lets our teams monitor and retrain those models so that they're always performing to our standards. So far, we've been showing you the data science experience available behind the firewall that we're using to build and train models. Through a new published feature, you can build models and deploy them anywhere. In another environment, private, public, or anywhere else with just a few clicks. So here we're publishing our model to the Watson Machine Learning Service. It happens to be in the IBM cloud and also deeply integrated with their data science experience. After publishing and switching to the Watson Machine Learning Service, you could see that our stock affinity model that we just published is there and ready for use. So this is incredibly important. I just want to say it again. The data science experience allows you to train models behind your own firewall, take advantage of your proprietary and sensitive data, and then do deploy those models wherever you want with ease. So summarize what we just showed you. First, IBM's data science experience supports all teams. You saw how our data engineer populated a project with trusted data sets. Our data scientists developed, trained, and tested a machine learning model. Our developers used APIs to integrate machine learning into their apps. And how IT can use our integrated model management dashboard to monitor and manage model performance. Second, we support all data, on-premises, in the cloud, structured, unstructured, inside your firewall, and outside of it. We help you bring analytics and governance to where your data is. Third, we support all tools. The data science tools that you depend on are readily available and deeply integrated. This includes capabilities from great partners like Hortonworks 
and powerful tools like our very own IBM SPSS. And fourth and finally, we support all deployments. You can build your models anywhere and deploy them right, right next to where your data is, whether that's in the public cloud, private cloud, or even on the world's most reliable transaction platform, IBM Z. So see for yourself. Go to the Data Science Experience website, take us for a spin. And if you happen to be ready right now, our recently created Data Science Elite team can help you get started and run experiments alongside you with no charge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. It seems like a great time to get started. And thanks to Siva for taking us through it. Rob and I will be back in just a moment to add some perspective right after this. All right, once again, joined by Rob Thomas. And Rob, obviously, we got a lot of information here. Yes, we've covered a lot of ground. This is intense. You got to break it down for me, because I think we zoom out and see the big picture. What better data science can deliver to a business? Why is this so important? I mean, we've heard it through and through. Yeah, well, I heard it a couple times. But it starts with businesses have to embrace a data-driven culture. And it is a change. And we need to make data accessible with the right tools and a collaborative culture because we've got diverse skill sets in every organization. But data-driven companies succeed when data science tools are in the hands of everyone. And I think that's a new thought. I think most companies think, just get your data scientists some tools, you'll be fine. This is about tools in the hands of everyone. I think the panel did a great job of describing about how we get to data science for all, building a data culture, making it a part of your everyday operations. And the highlights of what Dan just showed us that's some pretty cool features for how organizations can get to this, which is you could see IBM's data science experience, how that supports all teams. You saw data analysts, data scientists, application developer, IT staff all working together. Second, you saw how we support all tools and your choice of tools. So the most popular data science libraries integrated into one platform. And you saw some new capabilities that help companies avoid lock-in where you can import existing models created from specialist tools like SPSS or others, and then deploy them and manage them inside of data science experience. That's pretty interesting. And lastly, you see we continue to build on this best of open tools, partnering with companies like H2O, Hortonworks, and others. Third, you can see how you use all data no matter where it lives. That's a key challenge every organization is going to face, private, public, federating all data sources. We announced new integration with the Hortonworks data platform where we deploy machine learning models where your data resides. That's been a key theme, analytics where the data is. And lastly is supporting all types of deployments. Deploy them in your Hadoop cluster, deploy them in your an integrated analytics system, or deploy them in Z, just to name a few. A lot of different options here. But look, don't believe anything I say. Go try it for yourself, data science experience, Anybody can use it. Go to datascience.ibm.com. And look, if you want to start right now, we just created a team that we call Data Science Elite. These are the best data scientists in the world that will come sit down with you and co-create solutions, models, and prove out a proof of concept. Good stuff. Thank you, Rob. So you might be asking, what does an organization look like that embraces data science for all? And how could it transform your role? I'm going to head back to the office and check it out. Let's start with the perspective of the line of business. What's changed? Well, now you're starting to explore new business models. You've uncovered opportunities for new revenue sources and all that hidden data. And being disrupted is no longer keeping you up at night. As a data science leader, you're beginning to collaborate with a line of business to better understand and translate the objectives into the models that are being built. Your data scientists are also starting to collaborate with the less technical team members and analysts who are working closest to the business problem. And as a data scientist, you've stopped feeling like you're falling behind. Open source tools are keeping you current. You're also starting to operationalize the work that you do. And you get to do more of what you love. Explore data, build models, put your models into production, and create business impact. All in all, it's not a bad scenario. Good. <laughs> All right, we are back, and coming up next, so this is a special time right now, because we got a great, great guest speaker. New York Magazine called him the spreadsheet psychic, a number-crunching prodigy who went from correctly forecasting baseball games 
to correctly forecasting presidential elections. He even invented a proprietary algorithm called PICOTA for predicting future performance by baseball players and teams. And his New York Times best-selling book, The Signal in the Noise, was named by Amazon.com as the number one best nonfiction book of 2012. He's currently the editor-in-chief of the award-winning website 538 and appears on ESPN as an on-air commentator. Big round of applause. My pleasure to welcome Nate Silver. Thank you. We met backstage. It feels yes. weird to reshake your hand, but you know, for, for the audience. I had to give the intense, firm grip. Definitely. You know, the ninja grip. So you and I have crossed paths kind of digitally in the past, which is really interesting is I started my career at ESPN and I started as a production assistant and later back on air for sports technology. And I, I go to you to talk about sports because yeah. wow has ESPN upped their game in terms of understanding the importance of data and analytics and what it brings, not just to MLB, but across the board. No, it's really infused into the way they present the broadcast. You'll have win probability on the bottom line and you know they'll incorporate 538 metrics and, and how they cover college football, for example. Um, so, I mean, you know, ESPN, um, like look, sports is maybe the perfect, if you're a data scientist, like the perfect kind of test case. Um, and the reason being that like sports consists of problems that have rules and have structure. Um, and when problems have rules and structure, then it's a lot easier to work with. Um, so it's a great way to like kind of improve your skills as a data scientist. Of course, there are also important real world problems that are more open-ended and those present different types of challenges. Um, but it's such a natural fit. I mean, the teams, think about the teams playing the World Series tonight. Um, the Dodgers and the Astros are both like very data-driven, especially Houston. Golden State Warriors, the NBA champions, extremely data-driven. Um, New England Patriots, relative to an NFL team, the, you know, it's shifted a little bit. The NFL, the bar is lower. Um, but the Patriots are certainly very analytical in how they make decisions. So, you know, you can't talk about sports without talking about analytics. And I was going to save the baseball question for later because we are moments away from Game 7. Is yeah. anyone else watching Game 7? It's been an incredible series, probably one of the best of all time. Yeah, I mean... Do you, you have can, a prediction here? You can measure that too. So I don't have a prediction. 538 has the Dodgers with a 60% chance of winning. Um, basically LA because... <laughs> so you have, you have two teams that are about equal. But the Dodgers pitching staff is in better shape um, at the moment, at the end of a seven game series, and uh, they're at home. But so. the statistics behind the two teams is pretty incredible. Yeah, it's like the first World Series in I think 56 years or something where you have two 100 win teams facing one another. Um, there have been a lot of parity in baseball for a lot of years, not that many offensive or, or overall juggernauts, but this year, and last year with the Cubs and the Indians too really, but like this year, you have really spectacular teams in the World Series, it kind of is a showcase of modern baseball, lots of home runs, lots of strikeouts. Lots uh, of extra innings. Lots of extra innings, good defense, lots of pitching changes. So if you, if you love the modern baseball game, it's been about the best example that you had. If you, if you, you know, like a little bit more contact and fewer strikeouts, maybe not so much, but it's been a spectacular and very exciting World Series. It's amazing to talk, MLB is huge with analysis. I mean, hands down, but across the board, if you can provide a few examples, because there's so many teams and front offices putting such an, 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 an just a heavy intensity on the, on the analysis side and where the teams are going. And if you can provide any specific examples of teams that have really blown your mind, especially over the last year or two, because every year it gets more exciting, if you will. I mean, you know, so a big thing in baseball is defensive shifts. Um, so if you watch tonight, you'll probably see a couple of plays where if you're used to watching baseball, a guy makes really solid contact and there's a fielder there that you don't think should be there. Um, but that's really very data driven where you analyze where's this guy hit the ball. That part's not so hard, but also there's game theory involved because you have to adjust for the fact that he knows where you're positioning the defenders. He's trying therefore to make adjustments to his own swing. And so that's been a major innovation in, in how baseball is played. Um, you know, how bullpens are used too, where teams have realized that like actually um, having a guy across all sports pretty much, realizing the importance of rest and of fatigue and that you can be the best pitcher in the world, but guess what? After four or five innings, you're probably not as good as a guy who has a fresh arm necessarily. So, I mean, it really is like, these are not like subtle things anymore. It's not just, oh, on base percentage is valuable. It really affects kind of every strategic decision in, in baseball. The NBA, if you watch an NBA game tonight, seeing how many three-point shots are taken. Um, 
That's in part because of data and teams realizing like, hey, you know, three points is worth more than two. Once you're more than about five feet from the basket, um, the shoot percentage gets really flat, and so, and so it's revolutionary, right? Like teams that um, will shoot almost half their shots in the three-point range nowadays. Um, you know, Larry Bird, who wound up being one of the greatest three-point shooters of all time, um, took only like eight three-pointers his third year or first year in the NBA. So it's quite noticeable if you watch baseball or basketball in particular. Not to focus too much on sports, one final question. In, in terms of Major League Soccer and now, you know, in NFL, it, we're, we're having the analysis and having wearables where it can now showcase, if they wanted to on screen, heart rate and breathing and how much exertion. How much data is too much data and when does it ruin the sport? So I don't think, I mean, again, it goes sport by sport a little bit. I think in basketball you actually have a more exciting game. Yeah, you know, I think the game is more open now. You have more three-pointers. You have guys getting higher assist totals. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not one of those people who thinks, look, if you love baseball or basketball and you go in to work for the Astros, the Yankees, or, or the Knicks, or they probably need some help, right? <laughs> um, you know, you really have to be passionate about that sport because it's all based on what questions am I asking as I'm a fan or I guess an employee of the team or a player watching the game. Um, and there isn't really any substitute, I don't think, for the insight and intuition that a curious human has to kind of ask the right questions. And we can talk at great length about what tools do you then apply when you have those questions, but, but that still comes from, from people. You know, I don't think machine learning can help with what questions do I want to ask of the data. It might help me get the answers. If you have a midfielder in a soccer game, though, not exerting, only 80%, and you're seeing that on a screen as a fan, and you're saying, so, could that person get fired at the end of the day, one day, with the data? So we found that actually some, in soccer in particular, some of the better players are actually more still. Um, so Lionel Messi, maybe the best player in the world, doesn't move as much as other soccer players do, and the reason being that, A, he kind of knows how to position himself in the first place, B, he realizes that, um, you know, you make a run and like you're out of position, that's like quite fatiguing. And, and particularly soccer, like basketball, is a sport where it's incredibly fatiguing. Um, and so, you know, sometimes the guys who conserve their energy, the kind of old school mentality, like, oh, you have to hustle at every moment. I mean, that is not helpful to the team if you're hustling on an irrelevant play mm. and therefore on a critical play, can't get back on defense, for example. Sports, but also data, is moving exponentially, as we're just speaking about today. Tech, healthcare, every different industry. Is there any particular that's a favorite of yours to cover? And I imagine they're all different as well. I mean, I do like sports. We, we cover a lot of politics, too, which is different. I mean, in politics, I think people aren't intuitively as data-driven as they might be in sports, for example. I mean, it's, you know, it's impressive to follow the breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. Um, you know, it started out just kind of playing games and playing chess and poker and Go and things like that, but you really have seen um, a lot of breakthroughs in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of infused into, into everything. Really. You're known for your work in politics, though, especially presidential campaigns. Yeah. This year, in particular, was it insanely challenging? Did, what was the most notable thing that, that came out of any of your predictions? I mean, in some ways, um, looking at the polling was the easiest lens to look at it. So I think, you know, I think there's kind of a myth that um, last year's result was a big shock, and it wasn't really. If you did the modeling the right way, then you realize that, number one, polls have a margin of error. Um, and so when a candidate has a three-point lead, that's not particularly safe. Number two, the outcome between different states is correlated, meaning that it's not that much of a surprise that Clinton lost Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio. You know, I'm from Michigan, have friends from all those states, kind of the same types of people in those states. So those outcomes are all correlated. So, you know, what people thought was, oh, a big upset for the polls, I think was an example of how data science done carefully and correctly, where you understand probabilities, understand correlations. You know, our model gave Trump a 30% chance of winning. Other models gave him a 1% chance. And so, you know, that was interesting in that it showed that, number one, that modeling strategies and skill do matter mm -hmm. quite a lot. When you have someone saying 30% uh, versus 1%, I mean, that's a very, very big spread. Um, and number two, that like, these aren't like solved problems <laughs> necessarily. Although again, 
the problem with elections is that you only have one election every four years. Um, so I can be very confident that, um, that I have a better model. You know, even one year of data doesn't really prove very much. Even five or 10 years doesn't really prove very much. And so, you know, being aware of the limitations to some extent intrinsically um, in elections when you only get one kind of new training example every four years, there's like not really any way around that. There are ways to be more robust to sparse data environments. Um, but, you know, if you're identifying different types of business problems to solve, um, figuring out like what's the solvable problem where I can add value with data science is a really key part of, of what you're doing. You're such a leader in this space in data and analysis. It would be interesting to kind of peek back the curtain, understand how you operate, but also how large is your team, how you're putting together information, how quickly you're putting it out. Because I think in this right now world where everybody wants things instantly, yeah. there's also, you want to be first too in the world of journalism, but you don't want to be inaccurate because that's your credibility. No, and we talked about this before, right? You know, I think on average speed is a little bit overrated in journalism. I think um, it's a big problem in journalism. Yeah. Especially in the tech world, you have to be first, you have to be first, and it's just pumping out, pumping out, and there's got to be more time spent on stories, if I can speak subjectively. Yeah, for sure, but you know, but at the same time, um, we are reacting to the news, and so, and so we have people that come in, we hire most of our people actually from journalism. But How you many people do you have on your team? About 35. Um, but if you get someone who comes in from an academic track, for example, they might be surprised at how fast journalism is. That even though we might be slower than the average website, the fact that there's a tragic event in New York, um, are there things we have to say about that, right? A candidate drops out of the presidential race. Are there things we have to say about that in periods ranging from minutes to days as opposed to kind of weeks to months to years in the academic world? Um, the corporate world moves faster. What is a little different about journalism is that, um, is that you are expected to have more precision where people notice when you make a mistake. I mean, kind of in corporations, you have maybe less transparency. Mm -hmm. If you make um, 10 investments and seven of them turn out well, um, then you'll get a lot of profit from that, right? In journalism, it's a little different. If you make kind of seven predictions or say seven things and seven of them are very accurate and three of them aren't, you'll still get criticized a lot for the three just because that's kind of the way that journalism is, and so the kind of combination of needing, um, you know, not having that much tolerance for mistakes, but also needing to be fast, that is tricky. And I criticize um, other journalists sometimes, including for not being data-driven enough, but like the best excuse any journalist has, like this is happening really fast, and it's my job to kind of figure out in real time what's going on and provide useful information to the readers, and that's, and that's really difficult, especially in a world where, I mean, literally, you know, I'll probably get off the stage and check my phone and who knows what President Trump will have tweeted or what things will have happened. Um, but it really is kind of 24-7. Because it's 24-7 with 538, one of the most well-known sites for data, are you feeling micromanaging on your people? Because you, you do have to hit this balance. You can't have something come out yeah. four or five days later. I'm, I'm not are you overseeing everything? I'm not by nature a micromanager, and so you, you try to you try to hire well, you try and let people make mistakes. I mean, the flip side of this is that if, you know, a news organization that never had any mistakes, never had any corrections, like that's, that's wrong, right? Like you have to have some tolerance for error because you are trying to decide things in real time and figure things out. You know, I think transparency is a big part of that. Say, here's what we think and here's why we think it. Um, if we have a model to say, it's not just the final number, here's a lot of detail about how that's calculated in some cases, we release the code and the raw data. Sometimes we don't because there is a proprietary advantage. But quite often, you know, we're saying, we want you to trust us, and it's so important that you trust us. Here's the model. Go play around with it yourself. Here's the data. Um, and so, you know, and that's also, I think, an important value. That speaks to open source and in your perspective on that in general. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of open source. I worry that I think sometimes the trends are a little bit away from open source, but by the way, one thing that happens when you share your data, um, or you share your thinking at least in lieu of the data, you can definitely do both, is that readers will catch um, embarrassing mistakes that you made. By the way, even having open sourceness within your team, I mean, we have editors and copy editors who will often like save you 
from really embarrassing mistakes. Um, and by the way, it's like not necessarily people who have a training in data science. I would guess that of our 35 people, like maybe only five to 10 have a kind of formal background in what you would call data science. I think um, that speaks to the theme here that everybody's yeah. kind of got to be data literate. But yeah, it is like it is like you have a good intuition. You have a good BS detector, basically. And you have a good intuition for, hey, um, this looks a little bit out of line to me. You know, and sometimes that can be based on domain knowledge, right? We have um, one of our copywriters, she's a big college football fan, and we had an algorithm we released that um, tries to predict what the human being selection committee will do. Um, and she was like, why is LSU rated so high? Because I know that LSU sucks this year. You know? <laughs> um, and we looked at it, uh, and she was right, right? There was a bug where it like, had forgotten to account for their last game where they lost to Troy or something. And so, well, it also and so, speaks to the human element as well. It does, but like, you know, in general, as a rule, if you're designing a kind of a regression-based model, it's different in machine learning where you have like more, when you kind of build in the tolerance for error, but if you're trying to do something more precise, then, um, you know, so much of it is just debugging. It's saying, that looks wrong to me, and I'm gonna investigate that, and sometimes it's not wrong. Sometimes your model actually has an insight that you didn't have yourself, but, but fairly often it is, and I think kind of, you know, what you learn is like, hey, if there's something that bothers me, um, I wanna go investigate that now and debug that now because the last thing you want is where all of a sudden um, the answer you're putting out there in the world hinges on a mistake mm. that you made. Because you never know if you have, um, so to speak, like a thousand lines of code and they all perform something differently. You never know when you get like in a weird edge case where this one decision you made um, winds up being the difference between you're having a good forecast and a bad one, and a defensible position and an undefensible one. So, you know, so we definitely are, are quite diligent and careful, um, but it's also kind of knowing like, hey, where is an approximation good enough and where do I need more precision? Because you can also drive yourself crazy in the other direction where, you know, it doesn't matter if the answer is 91.2 versus 90. Um, and so you can kind of go 91.234 and it's like kind of A, false precision, and B, like not a good use of your time. So, you know, that's where I do still spend a lot of time is thinking about like which problems are quote unquote solvable or approachable with data and which ones aren't. And when they're not, by the way, you're still allowed to report on them. We are a news organization, so we do traditional reporting as well. And then kind of figuring out when do you need precision versus when is being pointed in the right direction good enough. I would love to get inside your brain and see how you operate on just like an everyday walking to Walgreens movement. It's like, oh, if I cross the street in point two, it's not. I, I mean, is it like maddening in there? No, not really. I mean, I'm like, this is an honest question. If I'm looking for airfares, I'm a little more careful. But but no, look, part of it is like you don't want to waste time on on unimportant decisions, right? Uh, I will like sometimes if I can't decide what to eat at a restaurant, I like flip a coin, right? The chicken and the pasta both sound That's not high really tech good. Aid. We want better. But that's the point, right? It's like I, both the chicken and the pasta are gonna be really darn good, right? So I'm not gonna waste my time trying to figure it out. I'm just gonna like have an arbitrary way to decide. In serious in business, how organizations in the last three to five years have just evolved with this data boom how are you seeing it as a, in a, from a consultant point of view? Do you think it's an exciting time? Do you think it's a you must act now time? I mean, we, we do know that like you definitely see um, a lot of talent among the younger generation now. That So 538's been at ESPN for, for four years now. Um, and man, the, the quality of like the interns we get uh, has improved so much in four years. The quality of the kind of young hires that we make straight out of college has improved so much in four years. So you definitely do see um, a younger generation for which this is just part of their bloodstream and part of their DNA and also particular fields that we're interested in. So we're interested in people who have both a data and a journalism background. We're interested in people who have a visualization and a coding background. A lot of what we do is very like, um, very much interactive graphics and so forth. And so, and so we do see those skill sets coming into play a lot more. And so the kind of shortage of talent that had, I think, frankly, been a problem for a long time, um, I'm optimistic based on the young people in our office. It's a little anecdotal, but like, you know, but you can tell that there are so many more programs that are kind of teaching students the right 
set of skills that maybe weren't taught as much a few years ago. But when you're seeing these big organizations, ESPN is a perfect example, mm -hmm. moving more towards data and analytics than ever before. Yeah. You would say that's obviously true. And oh, for sure. It's, if you're not moving that direction, you're going to fall behind quickly. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, I mean, if you read my, my book, or uh, I guess people have a copy of the book, or you know, in some ways it's saying, hey, there are a lot of ways to, to screw up when you're using data, and we've built bad models. We've had models that um, you know, were bad and got good results, good models that got bad results, and everything else. But the point is, that, like, the reason to be out in front of the problem is so you give yourself more runway um, to make errors and mistakes and to learn kind of what works and what doesn't and who, which people to put on the problem. Um, you know, I sometimes do worry that a company says, oh, we need data, and everyone kind of agrees on that now. We need data science. Then they have some big test case, and they have a failure. And they maybe have a failure because they didn't know really how to, how to use it well enough. But like learning from that and iterating on that, and so by the time that you're on the third generation of kind of a problem that you're trying to solve, um, and you're watching everyone else make the mistake that you made five years ago, I mean, that's really powerful. But that does mean that like getting invested in it now, getting invested both in technology and the um, human capital side is, is important. Final question for you as we run out of time. 2018 beyond, what is your biggest project in terms of data gathering that you're working on? I mean, there's a, there's a midterm election coming up. That's so a big thing for us. Um, we're also doing a lot of work um, with NBA data. So for, um, for four years now, the NBA has been collecting player tracking data. So they have a 3D cameras in every arena. So now you can actually kind of quantify, for example, um, how fast a fast break is, for example, or literally like where a player is and where the ball is um, for every NBA game now for the past four or five years. And there hasn't really been an overall metric of player value that's taken advantage of that. Um, the teams do it, but the, in the NBA, the teams are like a little bit ahead of journalists and analysts, so we're trying to have like a really, truly next generation stat. Um, it's a lot of data, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, sometimes I now more oversee things, that's what I did myself, and so you're like parsing mm -hmm. through many, many, many lines of code, and like, um, but, but yeah, so we hope to have that out at some point in the next few months. Anything you've personally been passionate about that you've wanted to work on and kind of solve? I mean, the NBA thing, it's, I am a pretty big basketball fan. You can do better so. than that. Come on, I want something real personal that you're like, I gotta crunch the numbers. You know, we tried to figure out where the best burrito in America was a few years ago. <laughs> I'm gonna end it there. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank cool, you. thank you. <laughs> I thought we were gonna chat World Series, you oh, know, yeah. burritos, important. I wanna thank everybody here in our audience. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Perfect way to end the day. And for a replay of today's program, just head on over to ibm.com slash DS for all. I'm Katie Linendahl, and this has been Data Science for All. It's a whole new game. <laughs> cool, thank you. Test one, two, one, two, three. Hi guys, I just want to quickly let you know as you're exiting, a few heads up. Downstairs right now, there's going to be a meet and greet with Nate. And we're going to be doing that with clients and customers who are interested. So I would recommend before the game starts and you lose Nate, head on downstairs. And also the gallery is open until 8 p.m. with demos and activations. And tomorrow, make sure to come back too because we have exciting stuff. I'll be joining you as your host and we're kicking off at 9 a.m. So bye everybody, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this evening's webcast. If you are not attending All Cloud and Cognitive Summit tomorrow, we ask that you recycle your name badge at the registration desk. Thank you. Also, please note there are two exits on the back of the room on either side of the room. Have a good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the meet and greet will be on stage. Thank you.